Hey, I want to say welcome to anybody that's watching live streaming online. It's great to have you with us here today at Life Christian Fellowship. Hey, next Sunday, um, uh, Pastor Don and Robin Emmel are going to be with us. They're dear friends, but they're just amazing leaders. They're uh, leaders of our ministry network of uh, over 400 uh, Assemblies of God churches throughout Pennsylvania and Delaware. And um, Pastor Don leads this, uh, this, this great team of churches and individuals. So when we send our kids to camps and conventions and things like that, uh, we've got this team of leaders that help just set all of that up. And so uh, Don and Robin are going to be with us. You will be incredibly blessed because uh, Pastor Don is an amazing preacher from the scriptures. And I know that he will come with a strong message on his heart and you will be encouraged and you will be inspired and you'll probably be challenged a little bit as well. So you just need to be here next Sunday, uh, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock. It'll be great to have you here. Uh, are you ready? Let's head into the scriptures. And if you have a Bible, if you've got whether it's on your phone or if you've got a physical Bible that's with you here today, uh, we are going to focus in Acts chapter 12. There is a big miracle that we're going to look at. And Peter is a central figure in a story uh, with a uh, regional tetrarch king by the name of Herod. This is the passage. I'm going to read it. Here we go. So about this time, King Herod arrested some people who belonged to the church, and he planned to make them suffer greatly. He had James killed with a sword. James was John's brother. By the way, these are the two fishermen guys, Zebedee, sons of Zebedee, all right? Uh, so, so James was John's brother, and Herod saw that the death of James pleased some Jews, so he arrested Peter also, and this happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Passover. After Herod arrested Peter, he put him in prison, and Peter was placed under guard, and he was watched by four groups of four soldiers each. Do you get the point? Security is high here. Herod planned to put Peter on public trial. It would take place after the Passover feast. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church prayed hard to God for him. Now, it was the night before Herod was going to bring him to trial, and Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, and two chains held him there. And lookouts stood guard at the entrance, and suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the prison cell and the angel struck Peter on his side. Peter woke up. Quick, the angel said, get up. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. And then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Put on your coat, the angel told him, follow me. So Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. <laughs> He thought he was seeing a vision. He passed the first, the second guards. Then they came to the iron gate leading to the city, and it opened for them by itself, and they went through it. And they walked the, uh, the length of one street, and suddenly the angel left Peter. Now then Peter realized what had happened. He said, now I know for sure that the Lord has sent his angel. He set me free from Herod's power. He saved me from everything the Jewish people were uh, hoping would happen. And when Peter understood what had happened, he went to Mary's house. Now, Mary was the mother of John Mark. This is the guy that went out on missionary journey with Paul Barnabas, but also he, he's the one that in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, John Mark, he wrote that. Now, many people had gathered in her home, and they were praying there. And Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. And she recognized Peter's voice, and she was so excited that she ran back, and she didn't even open the door for him. So Peter's at the door, she exclaimed. You are out of your mind, girl, they said to her, but she kept telling them it was true. And so they said it must be his angel. The idea is here that there's, there was this kind of sense or a belief that people had guardian angels that could appear in the form of that individual after they had died. So it must be his angel. And Peter just kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. And, and Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. And he explained how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Now tell James, the 
and the other brothers and sisters. This isn't the James who's been killed. This would be James, the half-brother of Jesus, that later on we find in the history of, that, of the early New Testament church became really a, at least an administrative leader, but probably the leader of the church there in Jerusalem. So tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he went to another place. Now in the morning, the soldiers were bewildered. They couldn't figure out what had happened to Peter. So Herod had them look everywhere for Peter, but they didn't find him. And then Herod questioned the guards closely, and he ordered that they be put to death. Now, then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea, and he stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So they got together, asked for a meeting with him. This was because they depended on the king's country to supply them with food, and they gained the support of Blastus, and then asked for peace, and Blastus was a trusted personal servant of the king, King Herod. Now, the appointed day came, and Herod was seated on his throne, and he was wearing his royal robes, and he made a speech to the people. And then they shouted, this is the voice of a god, it's not the voice of a man. And right away, an angel of the Lord struck Herod down, and Herod had not given praise to God. So he was eaten by worms and died. By the way, where are the middle schoolers when you need them here? They would love this passage. <clears throat> but God's word continued to spread, and many people believed the message. And Barnabas and Saul finished their task. And then they returned from Jerusalem, and they took John Mark with them. And so closes Acts chapter 12. Now, what we're going to do this morning is I just want to give you six takeaways from this passage of Scripture as we look at it. So are you ready? Let's go. You have a message handout. There's some blanks that you can fill in to help you follow along. It's also there so you get a little bit of an idea of how much longer do we have uh, in this message before we wrap up. Some of you love it for that. Here's takeaway number one. Persecution is the natural consequence of a radical confession. And let me explain this to you. <clears throat> the Christian confession that emerged in the early New Testament church is Jesus is Lord. It is a direct challenge to Caesar's authority, for this was the title that was ascribed to Caesar in the Roman Empire. As worshipers of one God, Christians could not participate in burning incense to the emperor or treating him in any sense as divine. The result was centuries of surging persecution against the church. Now, today we don't understand how significant or radical that confession Jesus is Lord was in the context of the Roman Empire. The de facto imperial confession was Caesar is Lord, that is, Caesar is sovereign in the world, and he has authority over just about every aspect of life. But the preaching of the apostles in the early New Testament church, Paul makes it clear in Romans chapter 10, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. This is an, an easy little just in the confines of the walls of the church kind of confession, but for the individuals who are in Rome, when they declare that Jesus is Lord, it is a radical confession. This was the confession of the first Christians, and it stood diametrically opposed to a world that would say Caesar is Lord. And so they went out and they preached who this one Jesus is. Paul writes and says he is the son of the image the Son is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Their lives were all about just one radical confession. Jesus is Lord. 
And when you have a radical confession like that in a world that, that doesn't align with that sense and with those thoughts, persecution breaks out. About this time, King Herod arrested some people who belonged to the church who claimed to make them suffer greatly. So he had James killed with a sword. By the way, he could have been run through with a sword or it could be that he was beheaded. A lot of it depends on whether it was the Roman soldiers that did it. If that was the case, he would have been beheaded. Jews would have not done that. They would have run him through with the sword. But either way, James was killed and Herod saw that the death of James pleased some Jews, so he arrested Peter also. And by the way, this is part of the line of uh, Herodian kings. These are tetrarchs. They are subordinate rulers to uh, Caesar. There's been Herod the Great, who is the Herod that is mentioned when Jesus was born. And uh, he was the one that, anyway, uh, put out a decree that, that babies would, would die because the wise men who came. And, and so Bethlehem, two-year-old and under, were killed. Um, he had a son, Herod Antipas. Uh, you'll find him also involved in Scripture, the beheading of John the Baptist. But this one is Herod Agrippa I. And he has a son, because we know from his demise that we'll get to shortly, but there's a son, Herod Agrippa II, and he's the one that the Apostle Paul stood before and made the appeal, O King Agrippa, in Acts chapter 26. Well, let me just tell you this. There will always be a ruling class. We know that, right? The solutions will never be through the govern governance of man. Jesus said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their officials exercise authority over them, but it will not be like that with you. And he said, true greatness is to be a servant. And then comes that mission statement, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So you will find that Luke, who writes the book of Acts, teaches that Satan's sphere of control is often related to and intermingled with the places of power in this world. Yes, even political governance. It is happening here against the early New Testament church because Herod is a politician. And what he finds out, his place is more secure when Jewish people are happy. And they're happy when these ones who are the followers of Jesus end up, we do away with them. And so this Sanhedrin Jewish leaders, they're happy about that. And so Herod is convinced that with holding Peter for trial, and truly there is a trial that will be nothing but a kangaroo court, that uh, he's ready to take Peter's life as well. Now, let's just jump on to takeaway number two. I love this one. You can, you can sleep soundly when you know it's all in God's hands. Now, Acts chapter 12, verse 6, we'll go back to it. You ready for that? Here we go. It was the night before Herod was going to bring him to trial, and Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, and two chains held him there, and lookout stood guard at the entrance. As if to test the church's faith to the limit and emphasize his consummate power over his enemies, the Lord seems to wait here to act and to tell the very eve of Peter's show trial and most likely probable, yes, execution. By his sleep here, Peter is modeling a deep trust in God's sovereignty. You remember this, right? Do you remember uh, Luke chapter 8? You'll also find the account in Matthew as well as in Mark. You remember the storm? Some of you have reminders of that, that God takes the seas and he puts them in jars. Do you remember that one? The first miracle that we looked at. And the disciples were in great commotion because of the storm that was on the Sea of Galilee, and Peter would have been there as well. And so they're waking up Jesus and saying, you've got to fix this storm because we're about to die. There is no kind of angst that you will find in Peter on this one. There is a marked difference. In fact, the cowardice that marked him in the phony fireside trial of Jesus before Jesus' crucifixion, it no longer dominates him. Do you remember? He was fearful when that slave girl came to him and began to question him. Aren't you one of those followers? Now, Peter has stood before the same religious leaders, and he has taken his stand. 
In fact, he boldly proclaimed to the Sanhedrin, these Jewish leaders, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected and which has become the cornerstone. And salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. In other words, this was his Jesus is Lord statement to Jewish leaders. Peter has also in Acts chapter 6 witnessed the boldness of Stephen in Acts chapter 6 and 7, and his consequential execution by stoning. Now it's been the execution of James, his fellow disciple and a constant companion with his three and a half years of training with Jesus. It has just transpired and James' blood is not fully dried. Peter rests secure. He now mirrors the behavior of his master who slept through the raging storm while Peter and the disciples panicked. How is he able to sleep when he knows the morning will mean certain execution? And by the way, he does sleep. He sleeps soundly. It's part of the reason that Luke talks about the whole commotion when the angel shows up and is nudging him and pushing him and saying, you need to get up. But notice how it's like, oh, yeah, and by the way, you need to go ahead and get your sandals on and get your coat on. And why is he doing that? It's because Peter is probably groggy because he has been sleeping so, so soundly. But I will tell you this, that what it really speaks of is that Peter is a changed man. You see, he is fully committed to the mission of Christ regardless of the outcome. So he doesn't know exactly. He assumes, because of what Herod is doing, he assumes that this politician is going to put him to death too, and all the Jews are going to be happy. And if the Jews are happy, then Caesar is going to be happy because there's no uproar that's taking place over in this area of Judea and Galilee. By the way, Christians have sung hymns about the peace of God for a long time. Uh, Psalm 3, verse 5 says, I lie down and sleep, I wake again because the Lord sustains me. There's an old hymn, we've never sung it here at this church. Norman J. Clayton, Jesus my Lord will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. We have sung William Dowell's contemporary song. My life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself, I give myself away. This is what Peter has done. And as a result, he can sleep so soundly so securely. He stood before the Sanhedrin and he has used these words. And by the way, this is, he's used the words, what's right in God's eyes? Um, to listen to you or to God. You be the judges. And then John and Peter said, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And when they got back, they prayed and asked that God would give them boldness. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God boldly. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Let me just tell you this. You can live your life in times that are uncertain and sometimes even fearful, and you can just be as steady as can be. You can sleep and rest soundly in the middle of the night when you know it's all in God's hands. Too many of us, too many of us, allow all the turmoil of the externals of life to absolutely shake us up. Oh, that God would come and shake us with the power of the Holy Spirit to so steady us that we just comprehend, my life is not my own. I belong to him. My life is in his hands. <clears throat> So I do not need to be afraid. Here's another takeaway. God has agents and resources that are beyond you and yours. Is there an amen to that? Is that kind of nice to know? We're not alone in this journey. We're not alone in this fight. We are solace, comforted by the Holy Spirit when we're overwhelmed, even by sorrow and suffering. We are energized with a power that never fails, never disappoints. If we will merely trust God and wait on him for the more that he has for us, and God has more. 
God has resources that are beyond your comprehension. This is what the passage says, right? Suddenly there is an angel of the Lord that appears. In the middle of this prison, there's a light that gleams forth in the prison cell. We're not exactly for sure what that looks like. It seems as if that the soldiers, those who are on guard, uh, remain asleep through all of this, and Peter's trying to figure it out. But the angel strikes Peter on the side. Peter woke up quick. Get up. Chains fell off Peter's wrists. And if you remember, there's two chains. Wouldn't you think one would be enough? But the angel said to him, put on your clothes, put on your sandals, put on your coat, follow me. And Peter followed him right out of the prison. God has resources. It's great to know. So we never have to be afraid. So I have to tell you a real quick story. And I'm moving fast. I've been reading some uh, just, just miracle stories. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's a book that uh, is entitled uh, Physician's Untold Stories, Miraculous Experiences Doctors <clears throat> Are Hesitant to Share with Their Patients or Anyone. It's things that they can't explain. And one of the stories is from Harold Adolph while he was serving in Ethiopia with medical missions. He was the only doctor for thousands of people that were in his region of Ethiopia. They would come from all over the country and he treated patients with the end stages of some of the most deforming uh, diseases imaginable. Many were at the brink of death and would not survive without emergency treatment or surgery. So he serves here at a hospital that is built from mud and straw bricks. It has 115 beds, there are two operating rooms. Only one of the operating rooms has electricity and a light bulb. He's the only doctor and he's got one nurse and there's a few people in training as kind of nurse assistance to help care for the sick and the suffering. Both rooms of these operating rooms have been bustling six days a week with emergencies that he would have to deal with on Sunday, and it's been a seven-month stretch for him in this service. But it was his calling. It was the thing, actually, that he dreamed of, to a graduate of University of Pennsylvania Medical School. So here he is following his calling, following his dream, medical missionaries for the cause of Christ, but there is the weight that was becoming too much for him, and so this devoted doctor was at a breaking point, both mentally and physically. So here he wakes up one morning, and he deviated from his normal prayer, because he knew that he was at a point of absolute exhaustion, and he said, Heavenly Father, I have been a faithful servant for these past seven months, and I hope I have done your will, but Father, I cannot go on. I need an experienced, well-qualified surgeon to take over my position and give me a break. If you cannot, cannot send someone to help me today, I cannot go on. Please, please send help. Amen. <laughs> so with a tear in his eye, Adolf walked, which was just directly across the street to the mud hospital to make his rounds to scrub for the first surgical case. There's a patient who has a growth that went from his neck down into his chest and into the right upper lung. This was not his specialty. He, he knew that a thoracic surgeon was best suited for this case. But while beginning the surgical procedure, there was a knock at the door of the operating room and it was his wife. She usually didn't come and disturb him. She thought this was kind of important. Harold. I want you to meet Dr. Ivan Moskovitz from Brooklyn, New York. Harold, he has come to relieve you. Now, listen, Moskovitz was a specialist in thoracic and cardiovascular surgery. He had wanted to go on a mission to use his training to help others in need. He awoke one morning and knew it was time, so Moskowitz spread a map of the world on a table. And he closed his eyes and he flipped the map around three different times and he put his finger down on the map. Sure enough, Ethiopia. So he booked a flight. He arrived in the capital of the country and when he did, he looked in a phone book. <laughs> he saw a small entry listing the medical mission with which Harold Adolph served. <clears throat> he called the number it's a number that goes to an individual. There are five hospitals that are there in Ethiopia with this type of mission. And Moskowitz had 
randomly uh, was assigned to work with a guy named Dr. Adolf. So he boarded a refurbished DC-10 and he flew to the remote village arriving on its grassy airstrip. This was no coincidental doctor. Adolf knew it. This was not random chance. You see, God knew the exhausted prayer from a doctor's lips before the words were ever uttered and he orchestrated the miracle that provided a one-month respite for a weary servant of the Lord. It was a break that rejuvenated him and his family. And when he returned, he continued in service there for 42 more years of faithful mission service. And he had the good sense that every five months he took a one-month break. <laughs> Harold Adolph explains, <clears throat> I now know that when I struggled the most, I was the closest to my creator. When I felt I could not take another step on the grueling Ethiopian path, he was there and he carried me. Now that I am older <clears throat> and no longer able to continue a mission in Africa, I know that he continues to guide my path and when I finally complete my journey, he will be there to carry me home. You see, it's true, God has agents and resources that are beyond you and yours. Okay, here's number four. Hurry with me. God majors in the surprise factor. He is unpredictable, he is uncontrollable. Now I'm thankful that he has set everything in motion for the dependability that we desperately need from God, but also from all of creation. And so he has established order, but this God can also suspend order at any time and break you. This is the surprise factor. Just when you think you have him all figured out, you discover that he does not fit in your box. James is dead, Peter is next, Peter rests in the hands of God, but he does not anticipate the deliverance from the hands of the corrupt Herod who is ready to bring Peter to a kangaroo court for his political gain. A dead Peter means a more politically secure Herod. So Peter, who has experience with vision, somehow feels that this middle-of-the-night rescue is just spiritual imagery. Until he learns, right? Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. So they passed through the first the second guards. Then they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself. They went through it. They walked the length of one street, and suddenly the angel left Peter. And then Peter realized what had happened. He said, now I know for sure that the Lord has sent his angel. He has set me free from Herod's power. He saved me from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. So the church has prayed hard. But not only is Peter surprised, they're, they're surprised too. I love the way, and, and by the way, for people that just feel that these are just made-up stories, these are, just, these are just myths to try to teach nice little lessons. Do you, do you catch how Dr. Luke, the physician Luke, who records these words in the book of Acts and how specific he is with all of this um, eyewitness type of testimony from individuals? So here you got the young girl Rhoda. Her name, Rhoda, means rosebud. Can't you just hear it? There's little Rosie. She heads to the, oh, it's Peter. I can't believe it. And off she goes back. And it interrupts their prayer. And then they look at her and say, you crazy girl. Rosie, come on. It's not. Anyway, all, all, all of these details. But Peter is surprised. In addition to that, you will find the church ab absolutely surprised. Luke, Luke relates Peter's evaluation of experience, though awake enough to obey the orders, he does not think he is experiencing it's real, but it is real. And then the church can't believe it's real, but it is, it is, it's, 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 it's real. Um, I almost get the feeling, uh, this isn't Rosie, this isn't Rhoda, but this is the image I have in my head that like when Frodo puts the ring on his finger, and then all of a sudden it's like, I get the feeling that that was kind of the surprise experience for Peter where it's like it becomes invisible and off he goes out of the prison. But there's no limit to a big God. Even the guards are confused, by the way, from this. Peter understood what had happened. He went to Mary's house. You've read that. We've read that. Let's move on. Um, look what happens with the soldiers. The soldiers are bewildered for good reason. 
the one that they're guarding as their prisoner, he is gone, and they know what that means. That means most likely they will die, and guess what? They do in the morning, right? They, uh, their lives are done. Herod does away with them. Here's a number five takeaway. Wicked power brokers may have their moment, but they dissolve in a puddle under the crushing weight of God's authority. Now, I love this story. Because here is Herod. For his political gain, he's just toying with people who are meaningless to him. And he has his moment, but his moment is very short-lived. He is four years into his regional reign. And in the moment, uh, Josephus talks about this, the Jewish historian, in the moment where it's the early morning hours, okay? The sun is coming up. He's just come out of a touchy situation with these arguments with people from Tyre and Sidon, and there's been a peace accord. And he's like ready for his Nobel Peace Prize. And he puts on these royal robes, and Josephus talks about that these robes, there are silver that's woven all the way through that, and with the coming up of the sun and the morning light, it strikes him. And it's just this gleaming image, and as everybody is watching this, and they hear him speak, and it's like, oh, he's a god. Okay. So Herod had them look everywhere for Peter. They didn't find him. Herod questioned the guards. He puts them to death. Okay, all right, let's go on. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea. Okay, so he stays there. He's got the peace accord. Here we go. The appointed day came, and Herod was seated on his throne, and he's wearing his royal robes these brilliant robes, he's making the speech to the people, and they begin to shout, this is the voice of a God. It's not the voice of a man. And right away, an angel of the Lord struck Herod down, and Herod, Herod had not given praise to God. So he was eaten by worms, and he died. Josephus talks about it. The people see it. As he addresses the assembly, the populace there in Caesarea, the delegation from Tyre and Sidon, they begin to cry out, and Herod does not refuse their homage, their worship. And so immediately an angel of the Lord strikes him down. He's eaten by worms. Now this is the image that I get. It's the Wicked Witch of the West that just... Now, I will tell you this, that Josephus talks about this also. But there is an immediate where he bends over in pain, and um, there is a condition that he would have, but literally, anyway, the worms eating his intestines, and bends over in excruciating pain. So from that, they grab him away, and in five days, he is finished and eaten up by the worms. It's an excruciating condition that uh, was of great agony. By the way, this, this is not an unusual. Um, God has always spoken that wicked power brokers will have their moments, but God's crushing authority will come. It's one of the places you'll find it clearest is in the book of Daniel where in chapter 2, you'll find Nebuchadnezzar who has a dream. And Daniel comes with the interpretation of that, and he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you, the Babylonian Empire, you are this head of gold, and there are kingdoms that will come after you. But he tells him what the dream was and says, while you were watching this, there was a rock that was cut out, but not by human hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. And the wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain 
and filled the whole earth. Well, God had shown King Nebuchadnezzar that although his uh, empire was great, it was nothing compared to the greatness of the kingdom that will endure forever, and it's the cornerstone of the Lord Jesus. The God of the heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to, an, to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever, is, is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. So let's just close with this one. God always triumphs, and his promise will be fulfilled. God always triumphs. Acts chapter 12, in many ways, is a transition. It is the closing of the first 12 chapters where you will find Peter, John, uh, the church in Jerusalem as the central place of God's workings. And chapter 13 on, what you will end up finding is that you will find and see that there is a sweeping move that begins to go out over all of the earth. And the Apostle Paul becomes the central figure. It's brought up here in Acts chapter 12. God's word continued to spread, and many people believe the message. Barnabas and Saul finished their task. They had returned. They returned from Jerusalem when they did, and they took John Mark with them, and off they go on missionary journeys. Now, why is this important that the chapter closes here? You see, persecution has been breaking out. It's not new. It's because of the radical confession. But the church is finding great confidence. They're finding confidence in their God. They know who their Savior is. They know who their Lord is. And so uh, they are totally devoted to the mission that was in front of them. But there's a promise to be fulfilled. Musicians, there's a promise to be fulfilled. Jesus had told Peter, when Peter made his Jesus is Lord confession, when we, he had said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded and says, oh, you are blessed, Peter. Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The time had not yet come. So here's Peter, chained in prison. But there is this big God that is in the middle of all of it and over all of it. And this big God sweeps on in with an angel to set him free. And as he set, is set free, God deals with the very one and turns the table on the very one that wants to use Peter as a pawn. And what God makes perfectly clear is, Peter, I am not done with you yet because there is a promise that I have made and it's going to be fulfilled. You've made this confession. Jesus is Lord. You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. And you're going to continue to preach this message. And there is nothing that will prevail over it, for I will build my church. Hell will not prevail. Peter, you're the rock. I believe we have this chapter in Scripture to remind us that our lives are in the hands of a big God. Nothing will shake us or move us or take us out. Our lives, the purpose that he has for them are smack dab in the middle of his hand. And it doesn't matter who aligns themselves against you. You are safe and steady in the hands of God. And he will triumph. And you will triumph with him you put your faith and trust in God. We thank you, Lord God. You are God. You're big God. You command angels. You break chains. Prison doors open before you. 
When you move, nothing can hinder your movement. For you're the creator of the universe, but you're also the one God who comes close to us, even when we're in trouble, God, and would you draw us out. So we put our trust in you. We turn towards you. We open our hearts to you, our lives to you. We trust you. In Jesus' name. Stand with me, would you? Take your hands off of them. Hold them close and sustain them. 
Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life. And it's a promise from Ascension that Jesus is Lord, that you have promised us life everlasting. And Father, may they find comfort and the peace with these family members, Lord, who have made themselves known to you. So we thank you, Lord. We bless you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want you to have an awesome week. If you'd like further prayer, come down to the front. We'd be glad to go ahead and partner with you in prayer. God bless you.